Army. <clears throat> what was your highest rank? When I was in Vietnam, it was uh, Specialist Fifth. After I, afterwards, I got out and joined the reserves, and I ended up retiring as a CW3 warrant officer. Okay. Um, and in which general locations did you serve? In Vietnam? Um, just throughout your whole service. Uh, I was in basic at Fort Dix, New Jersey. I was in uh, <clears throat> AIT at the Intelligence School at Fort Halliburton, Maryland. Um, I was in uh, Saigon, Vietnam, in Da Nang, Vietnam. And then I was at Fort Carson, Colorado. And then in the reserves I was in Cromwell, Connecticut, East Windsor, Connecticut, and Danbury, Connecticut. Okay. Um, so were you drafted or did you enlist in there? I enlisted. Um, where were you living at the time? New Britain, Connecticut. Okay. Uh, do you recall the date? That I enlisted? Right. Oh, yeah. Uh, what happened was I was going to college at the time and uh, I uh, almost was ready to graduate but didn't have enough credits and I ended up having to take three French courses and one biology course or something and the French courses you couldn't take all at the same time. So this was the uh, June of 1968 and I kind of was depressed and if I didn't do something I would be drafted and if you're drafted you have no choice as to what you want to do. So I ended up uh, going down to the post office in New Britain and I went to um, look at the recruiters. I know I didn't want to join the Marines. The Air Force recruiter wasn't in. The Navy recruiter I talked to and I couldn't see myself on a ship for four years. So I went to the Army recruiter and talked to him. And uh, he said to me, uh, well, what do you like? And I said to him, well, I like maps. He said, I got just a job for you. And uh, took about, I had to go take a test took about um, two or three weeks, ended up, you know, enlisting, taking the oath in New Haven, and then going by bus to Fort Dix, New Jersey. Okay. Um, so, uh, and you did boot camp at Fort Dix, right? Right. Um, how did it feel to be there? How was your first day there? My first day there was the first night. They took some blood and I almost passed out. Okay. And after that, I never looked at anybody ever giving me a needle or uh, taking my blood. Um, I found out that after I joined the Army, if, after about two or three days, I actually hated it. And the reason was the lack of personal freedom. They basically tell you what to do all the time. There's all these rules and regulations, and even though I don't violate rules and regulations in general, I hate somebody telling me to do stupid things, you know. Uh, yeah, I went through basic, and uh, it was the summer of 1968. It was hot. They sh you know, you had to be in certain physical shape by the time you got out. You had to be able to shoot a rifle and all this thing and do certain things. That's all. Okay. Um, do you remember any of your instructors? Yeah, I remember my drill sergeant, Sergeant Clarinet. He was going to, he had gone to Vietnam and he was going to um, go to OCS so he could become an officer. He was fairly decent. Okay. Um, any others? Oh, there was a Sergeant Douglas. He was a pain in the ass. Uh, one time we were getting shots, and um, the medics were giving us all these shots. And uh, what it, what happened when we were in basic is before you went to eat, you had to go on a horizontal ladder, hand over hand, mm -hmm. to, to strengthen your arms and everything. Well, what happened was my hands were soft, so I ended up getting blisters on my hand. And of course, since you do this like almost every day and never got the heal, the medic saw the blister and he says, what's that? Let me look at it. Yeah. And the sergeant goes, he looks at it and he says, 
after the medic got through with me, he says, uh, Boy, I don't know what your problem is, but if I was you, the company's waiting on you, and if you don't move, your ass is grass and I'm the lawnmower. Yeah. I said, yeah, the drills are you know, okay. <laughs> and, you know, I didn't make a big thing out of it. And it took me about a month after getting out of basic for the thing to heal, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, he, he wasn't bad either, but, you know, they, they, when you're in basic, they don't tell you about your rights. They don't tell you about what's called a UCMJ. They kind of just make you do certain things that they probably couldn't get away with if you knew what your rights were. Mm -hmm. um, so, was there anything you did to get through that? Anything you told yourself? or? Uh, no, not really. I mean, um, I got I got held over because I couldn't pa pass the PT test. It took me about a week or so after that, and then I got a, I got through basic, and uh, they sent me on to AIT. Okay, um, and that was in Maryland. Yeah, it was a place called Fort Halliburton, Maryland. <clears throat> it was in Balt actually in Baltimore or on the edge of Baltimore, Maryland. I ended up taking a bus from Fort Dix to uh, downtown Baltimore, Maryland, and then a city bus from the center of town, from the Civic Center to Fort Halliburton, and the bus went through a, like a rundown section with all sorts of strip joints and everything called the block. Mm -hmm. And then Fort Halliburton was located uh, in an industrial area, like where there were Chevy plants and things. And it basically <coughs> was a uh, bunch of warehouses and some uh, army uh, army buildings uh, that you went into basically event that that was the intelligence school for the army eventually they moved it to Fort Huachuca in Arizona because what was happening was uh, Russians from the uh, embassy in uh, DC would go there and take pictures of people entering and leaving because the Russians could travel 50 miles from their embassy. Mm -hmm. and this was within that range. And uh, yeah, so I ended up uh, taking a course that was called imagery interpretation, which actually was aerial photographic interpretation. And you learn how to read out aerial photographs and you used maps you had to find out where the pictures were being taken and um, you had to be able to identify um, Soviet um, equipment you learned how to do that and the course was probably I'm gonna say about 12 weeks long maybe 16 okay um, so your assignment there was just to go to school and learn right um, they had also they t they also had other courses. They had um, intelligence analysts, um, interrogators. Um, they had something called an area specialist, was actually a spy. They had uh, counterintelligence, which is like kind of like detectives, things like that. Mm -hmm. But you just did the imagery analysis, right? Okay. Um, so that was 16 weeks, you said? Right. Um, I, it was from uh, October 68 to uh, June, January of 1969. All right. Um, so after that, where did you go? Went to Washington, D.C. for a week to Fort McNair, which is a real nice place. It was on the Potomac River and everything. And uh, they were showing us how to, uh, I don't know, that we were doing some sort of uh, stuff to help them come up with a new way of identifying equipment or something. They were using models instead of real pictures or something. Um, so is that more of what you were doing at AIT, more classes, or was that... Well, yeah, it was class, about a week of classes. Okay. Um, After that, they sent me home on leave, and then uh, I went... And I think that was about two weeks worth. And then uh, me and a friend of mine, I flew to Pittsburgh and then New Orleans. We went there for Mardi Gras. Mm -hmm. And then from New Orleans, we went to San Francisco and Oakland. And Oakland, they sent me 
they sent us to Vietnam from there. Okay. Um, so where in Vietnam did you uh, land sure. initially? Well, I landed uh, in Benoit, which is a um, air base. And of course, I left Connecticut in February. It was like 20 degrees outside mm -hmm. at midnight. You get there and 8 o'clock in the morning, it's 90 degrees, you know. Right. And I started sweating for a month, you know. Uh, <clears throat> from there, we took a bus to Long Bin, which was a replacement center. And I had orders to go to the Americal Division. And when I got to the replacement center, they were changed and they uh, sent me to Saigon. Mm -hmm. And uh, in Saigon <coughs> was the headquarters of the 1st MI Battalion. And they had detachments in the country. They had like five detachments. And they decided to send me to Da Nang. So I was in Da Nang for 14 months, basically. I Basically, when you went to Vietnam, you went for a year. Yeah. Okay? But I decided to extend for another six months. And when I did that, I, was, I went back to Da Nang for uh, two months, and then they sent me to Saigon because uh, there was like they were drawing down, and instead of having five detachments, they ended up like making only one, one, th one, one um, company that handled the whole country, basically. Okay. Um, so when you got to when you first got to Vietnam, you said it was hot. Um, oh yes. What other impressions did you have of the uh, area? A lot of mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. uh, first night I got bit by like, I got 30 mosquito bites on one arm. Uh, a <coughs> friend of mine who was in the same room got over a hundred because he slept all night. I couldn't sleep because these things were flying in my ear and everything, you know. Mm -hmm. Thought we had a massive dose of malaria or something. Um. So you went, uh, when you got to De uh, Da Nang, what was your assignment there? I was an infantry interpreter. That's uh, basically, I was, um, the job was to read out aerial photographs that planes took, mostly Air Force planes, in the northern part of the country. Later on, when I ended up in Saigon, uh, I became, I was an aerial photo interpreter or the head of a certain bunch of aerial photo interpreters and we did the whole country plus parts of Cambodia. Okay. Because at that time we, we had invaded Cambodia. Mm -hmm. um, so what was your average day like doing that like imagery analysis? Day or night. We had, there were two shifts, day okay. shift and night shift. I, I worked nights about 60% of the time and days about 40% of the time. Uh, night shift probably started at uh, 7, 6.30, 7 in the evening and went to about 5.36 in the morning. And um, we'd go out, we lived in the, t in the city of Da Nang. We lived like in a kind of a two to three story building in the middle of the city. They called it the modern hotel. It really wasn't a hotel, but it, it was, as far as living conditions were concerned, it was probably better than like 99% of the people had when they were in Vietnam, okay? Like we had, had my room, had my own room or a room with one other guy. We had a bathroom, we had toilets, we had, you know, we didn't have air conditioning, but we had fans. Uh, we had maids that did our clothes, cleaned our clothes and everything, and polished our boots and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So we go out to the, um, and we worked in i -Corps compound, which was maybe a mile or two away. We'd take a truck there, and there was, uh, that's where the general for i -Corps was located, the Vietnamese general. And, uh, it was guarded, this compound was basically guarded by the Vietnamese. There was a wall around it. It wasn't that large. There was a little barbed wire, but not a lot. And um, there were, we had trucks there, and t on the back of the trucks were built like structures, like, like tin structures, and they were air conditioned because there were computers in there to uh, where because of the film, basically. There were computers to read out the film to a degree. 
what would happen is when we change shifts there'd be like a briefing and then uh, if there was film there then uh, we would uh, read out the film which was the Air Force used to or let's say the military used to fly missions all over the country uh, or let's say an I Corps at the time and they probably flew total in the country about let's say at a busy time could be about 400 to 450 missions that means jets taking pictures okay uh, and let's say most of the time they were taking pictures of the jungle because that's all you saw we only we only saw a film when I was there of uh, we never saw North Vietnam we never saw Laos we only saw, let's say, um, Vietnam and later on Cambodia. Anything else that went over the border, they would cut out. And these these jets were, most of them were Air Force, some of them were Marine, and a few were Army. Uh, and uh, the Air Force was basically um, based in Saigon. What they used to do is uh, they'd fly the missions, they'd come in, uh, somebody would look at the film, down there, down in Saigon, and then they'd fly it to, uh, they had a plane that flew around at night, or, well, actually three times a day, uh, and it, they would take it up to, um, let's say, Da Nang, and we'd have to pick it up, and then we'd uh, get it, and there was always negatives, big rolls of negatives, and 90% of the time you wouldn't find anything because there was jungle, you know, there was, everything was hidden, mm -hmm. okay? Every so often, you would find, let's say, units, enemy units, or foxholes, or trucks, or whatever, you know? And if you found it, well, you had to write a report it anyway, you know, even if you didn't find anything. But if you found something, you would, uh, you know, say where, what it was, where it was, and then you would send that report to uh, higher headquarters. And basically, we were like secondary or tertiary readout on this stuff. It, we read it out like either um, within a day or two days at the most, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, so that if it was on the ground when it was taken, chances are these people had moved since, you know. They didn't generally have buildings in any location because we'd bomb them, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, most bombed areas of Vietnam were like the DMZ, the border between North and South Vietnam, and uh, a thing called Par the Parrot's Beak, which was uh, in Cambodia and in Vietnam along the border that was closest to Saigon. Also around the cities we used to bomb it to a degree because the enemy would come in and uh, <clears throat> put rockets or mortars in certain areas within a certain distance, you know, let's say seven miles or something. So we used to bomb in those general areas, and there were a couple other areas too. Okay, so basically you were writing reports to um, the people who had ordered bombings on those areas. Not bombing, they'd order, uh, they'd order uh, missions in areas to try to find the enemy. Sometimes we do reports on areas that were bombed like let's say by B-52s to try to find if they destroyed anything you know mm -hmm. most of most of the reports were to find the enemy not to not to actually bomb them okay well if we found them they they would be bombed but generally it was to try to find the bad guys all right um and he said you could do day shifts or night shifts um yeah so the night shift would like it start at a certain time at about I'd say 10, 11 o'clock, <coughs> I would end up going to the airfield to get film. Then about 12 o'clock, we usually had uh, breakfast, and we'd go to the airfield to get breakfast, the Nang Air Base, which is about, about a mile away. And then uh, the rest of the night, you know, we'd read, read out film or look at the film or whatever the heck it was, and then at... Uh, Sometime about five thirty, six o'clock, there would be somebody would have to stay where we were. 
because you couldn't leave the place alone, you know, unlocked and all that stuff. The day shift you get in during the daytime and um, usually, I'll, I'll say something when it comes to the Army and uh, let's say intelligence or any other activity for that matter, if you work days or nights, generally you get more done during the night than you do during the day because during the day you have officers running around, you, you have people wanting to see what you're doing and things like that. So it had basically slow up whatever you were doing, okay, whereas at night there wasn't anybody coming to inspect or anything, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, so where's your, were your tasks and schedule, well your schedule is different, but were your tasks any different day or night shifts or were you doing the same? No, it was basically the same. Okay. Yeah. Um. Except, you know, you ate lunch and you ate supper. When you work night shift, you might eat supper and then you had two breakfasts or something, you know. Mm -hmm. I was, if you worked nights, you had a lot of eggs, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and did you have like complete choice over which one you'd choose? To eat? Uh, which shift you would choose? No. Okay. They put you on where they wanted to. Uh, they did, I think they did shift at times. In other words, let's say after a month, they might change you to the day shift for for a month or something like that. It, it varied, you know, mm -hmm. depending if what they needed people to do at a specific time. Or it might be every three weeks or two weeks. I can't tell the truth, I don't actually remember. I remember working nights for six weeks straight. That was tough. But, um, and then you'd get a day off every, let's say, um, let's say two weeks or so, you know or maybe even a week sometimes, and so that would screw up your your sleep schedule, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so your, your weekly schedule, you'd only get a day off every two weeks? Yeah, a day, at least once every two weeks, maybe two days at sometimes. Mm -hmm. Or when you were changing, or when you were changing schedules, you might get a day off there. In other words, if you were going nights to days, you would get a day off and then you change to, to days, let's say, or same thing if you were going from days to nights, mm -hmm. you would get a day off there, you know. So it's just kind of reset your schedule. Right. Okay. Um, did you see any combat or was this your only? We, when I was in Da Nang, um, we got rocketed about a half a dozen times when I was there, rocketed or mortared. And about two weeks after I was there, <clears throat> some colonel was coming to inspect us or so, all right? And this was 2 o'clock in the morning, and they said, uh, Ski, why don't you go into the uh, orderly room? We need to um, mop the floors or something. So I go to the orderly room, open up the door, come out with a mop, and all of a sudden a rocket came in. There was a helipad right across the road from us, and a rocket hit it. And I just happened to be looking in that direction. It was, I don't know, it was, let's say, from here to maybe 100 yards, maybe 200 yards. But I happened to look and see it hit. And it was like, it hit the helipad and it exploded. And you could see the shrapnel coming out because the shrapnel was white hot. Mm -hmm. So you could see that at night, you know. Most of the time I didn't, uh, you know, we'd have a rocket attack. And uh, we had a bunker next to uh, where we were working, which was like about four, the walls were four feet thick, or the top was at least, and uh, it was above ground because the water table was high. Uh, so you'd be in there and you'd hear, you'd hear these things hitting and uh, take you and pick you up off the seat once in a while, or you could hear shrapnel hitting the top because the top of the bunker had a, like a tin roof, so you can hear like, like metal falling down, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. When I, when I ended up in Saigon, uh, I'd say after about a couple weeks or a month after I was there, there was an American um, billet or something a couple blocks away, and it was a taller building than the other buildings around. And I, you could look out and see it, and one day they blew it up. It, somebody put a bomb in it, and you could see the, like, the roof go up and then down. It didn't destroy the thing totally, but killed a few people. Mm -hmm. 
Nobody uh, ever shot at me directly. Okay. Was there like a procedure when you were getting, um, when that was happening? Were you supposed to like go somewhere or was it just kind of like wait for it to be Well, there? you know, the funny thing was when we were working, we had a bunker where we were living. There was no bunker. Okay. okay? Yeah. If, if they were shooting rockets into the city, you got under the bed and if it came through the ceiling, you were dead. You know what yeah. I mean? Came through. Uh, when I was working one time, uh, I think it was Ho Chi Minh's birthday or something, they hit, they hit a um, ammunition dump on the other side of the river that had all sorts of mines or something. They went off and the, there was like, we had some glass in front of the building. The glass all got blown into the, like the building, okay, and I remember walking in the, uh, up the stairs the following morning over all these shards of glass and things. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that was basically it. So you never really got directly attacked at where you lived? No. Okay. Um, were there any casualties from that at the uh, bunker where you were working in Da Nang? Uh, well, people hit their head trying to get in. We, When I was there, we lost one guy. Okay. And... Uh, I saw him at 7.30 in the morning, and by 8.30 he was dead. He was taken, he, we had uh, vehicles that had to get gas every day, and he was taking a Jeep to uh, <clears throat> get gas, and uh, he was coming back, and a, um, what had happened was that a Marine had gone to a psychiatrist and told him he was cracking up and that he wanted out of the field and the psychiatrist said he was okay go back to where you come from well what he did was he flagged this guy down and shot him in the chest like seven times and killed him wow. and that was the end of it you know his name is on the wall yeah yeah um do you know what ended up happening to that marine was he arrested never heard uh, I'm sh well, that's a good question. You know, I, I really would like to have known, but no, I, I, I don't know. Okay. Being a Marine, they probably put him in prison, but who knows. Um, so after your assignment, Danae, you went to Saigon? Yeah, uh, well, I went home for a month after a year. Then I went back to Da Nang, and then after that, I went to, like you said, I was two months in Da Nang again. <laughs> and then they started like uh, moving troops out of the country and consolidating, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, basically ended up in Saigon for four months. And when we were in Saigon, we did the whole country plus parts of Cambodia. Okay. And this was uh, 1970 or 71? 1970, yeah. Okay. I'd say um, probably March... 70 or March or April of 70 to uh, September of uh, 70. Okay. Um, and did you have the same assignment in Saigon? Yeah. Basically, I was in charge of um, one of the shifts. I think we were, I'd like to say we worked nights most of the time, but I kind of remember that, yeah. Okay. Um, and what did you do as, um, what were your extra responsibilities being in charge? Well, basically, I had to make sure that uh, people uh, reported, you know, I had to look at people's work. And we had one photo interpreter that didn't like to report enemy activity, and he never found anything, you know. So one day I happened to uh, <coughs> watch him when he was looking at the film, and I said, no. what about those foxholes? Uh, I don't see them. I said, right there, look at them. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They've been reported already. Oh, really? So we had databases, we had like overlays that you put on the map to see if actually it had been, you know, it's, is it old, is it new, has, have we found it? Well, we didn't find that, it, what, they weren't on there. I said, you better report that. Oh, well, okay. But you had to watch this guy, you know. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of making sure everyone was doing their jobs right. correctly. Right, right. Okay. Um, what were your impressions of uh, Saigon? Okay, I was in Da Nang and I was in Saigon. I liked Da Nang a lot better. Um, it was, Da Nang was a smaller city. 
it was a lot cleaner. Saigon was, I don't know, one or two million people. It was a lot of pollution because um, what they were driving, which was, you know, military vehicles and they called things called cyclos, which were like, I don't know if they had a gasoline, they had a gasoline engine and they would spew the smoke out and everything and that would go on all day long basically until the night, you know. Mm -hmm. So it was a lot dirtier, a lot larger, I like to say hotter, could have been somewhat, but the difference in heat and humidity wasn't that much different. Uh, was, there were ways to spend money that could get you into trouble in Saigon, mm -hmm. whereas in the, Da Nang was a strange place in that it was off limits. We lived in a city, but we couldn't just like walk around, you know, and uh, go to a bar or go and buy something on the street. Uh, Saigon, you could do that. You could, you know, you could take a taxi cab, you know, downtown or anywhere you wanted to go, basically. And, you know, go to a, a restaurant, go to a hotel, do whatever you wanted. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Da Nang, you couldn't do that. The reason for that was when the Marines originally got to Da Nang, they start. They used to have um, brawls, mm -hmm. fights. Yeah. Marines like to fight themselves or other people if they get the opportunity. Mm -hmm. So they tear up the city. So they kind of made it off limits. Whereas Saigon, you had a lot more. That didn't happen. Okay. Um, so did you enjoy kind of the more personal freedom of Saigon? Uh... Did I enjoy more? Uh, yeah, I, yeah, to a degree. Like I say, I like the other place a little better. But, um, yeah, it was nice as far as that was concerned. Um, I'm trying to think. I remember one time I got stopped by the MPs and almost put in jail there because, uh, I don't know, I had to take a bus on base and I had walked up to the bus to get onto the base, and they said, you know, who are you, what are you doing? Well, I'm going on base, I got a uniform and all that. Yeah, well, you know, you don't have a pass, so you don't have this. So they take me to jail, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm sitting there. I, they didn't put me in a cell, though. I'm sitting there, and there are guys in cells, and all the sergeant says to me, what are you doing here? I said, well, your boys picked me up, you know. Uh, he said, well... You can go now. I said, well, what happens when I have to get off the base? He says, they got to do that again. No, no, don't worry about it, you know. Mm -hmm. And a friend of mine, same thing happened to him, you know, during one of these things. Except he used to, he used to have a sinus problem, so he had Dristan nasal spray in his pocket or something. They said, what's that? He says, Dristan nasal spray. No, you're using drugs. Mm -hmm. So he ended up in the same place, you know, strange. But that's, that's the military for you, you know. Okay. Um, so after Saigon, uh, after went home for a month, and then I went to Fort Carson, Colorado. Okay. And that's near um, Colorado Springs. Um, what was your assignment there? Well, I was supposed to be imagery interpreter, but I ended up being the uh, mail clerk. Okay. Because I had too many. See, in the United States, you don't do anything, you know, when it comes to intelligence work. So you know. They just said, uh, ski? Yeah. We're going to make you mail clerk. And it was actually a good job because actually I had something to do. I had a jeep to go get the mail, and I had some freedom of getting around, whereas the other guys were just like there, and they didn't do anything, you know? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Plus, they used to get details, where details are like going and, I don't know, painting rocks or whatever they want you to do at any time, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so it was pretty boring to work there, or did you, like... Uh, it wasn't bad. Um, I was there from, um, late October, November of 1970 to, uh, June of, uh, 71. And, you know, so I went through the winter, and so I was there for eight months, okay, and into the summer. And then, you know, I got out of the Army. It was it, it, it was, my situation was fairly good compared to most people's situation. But, you know, it was somewhat boring. If I had to be there a year, two years, it might be a different story, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, what were your impressions of um, uh, 
the Colorado base. What well, was my impressions of Colorado? Well, for one thing, they didn't like soldiers. Oh, okay. Colorado Springs did not like soldiers, mm -hmm. okay? For one thing, they had the Air Force Academy north of it, okay? Like, I don't know, 25 miles north. Fort Carson was about seven or eight miles south of it. And they were like the Golden Boys. And, uh, but it was funny because we had people. I remember there was one guy, a Russian interrogator, who used to write term papers for the cadets. You know, and these guys were supposed to be honorable and, you know, mm -hmm. all that type of thing. Uh, I remember getting a hard time. Um, I took a, I was taking a, um, I wanted to take a course, like they had a community college or something. And I wanted to take a course in, um, what was it, speech or something. And it was like, at that time, being in the Army was not a good thing, okay? I mean, you were looked down upon and all this. <clears throat> and I remember, like, the instructor, well, tell us about your experience. And I didn't want to do that. I mean, so basically I dropped out of the course, you know. Mm -hmm. So, that, plus I remember getting harassed one time at one of the hotels or something. Some house detective came, we were... We went on the roof of the hotel to look at the mountains and the view. Mm -hmm. He said, what are you doing up here? You've got to get out of here, that type of deal. You know. Okay, go ahead. Okay, when I was in Vietnam, uh, I'd say two or three months after I got there, we used to have different types of missions. Priority one, two, three. Most of our missions were three, okay? One day we got a priority one mission, and most of the priority one missions, we didn't get many of them. We're out in the middle of the jungle somewhere, okay? But this was like along the coast on the main road and all this other business. And I remember that it was me and my friend. And we're saying, why is it over there? It doesn't make sense. Usually they're out in the middle of the jungle. So we, you know, we got, we got the map and we f tried to figure out what it was. And then we looked at the film too. And the film was going to the Americal Division. And, uh, looked and it was just a bunch of like rice paddies and destroyed villages and <laughs> what it was was did you ever hear of the Milai massacre no oh you never did no but a year before uh, in 1968 an American company went into this area of Vietnam and killed like 680 people and they were civilians. They were basically told that everybody they find there was going to be enemy, okay? Plus that area was heavily booby-trapped and a lot of their guys had been killed in that general area before, so they were told it was going to be a uh, enemy area, so they killed everybody, men, women, and children. And it basically kind of faded away and it took a year for it to get into the newspapers and everything. And then what happened was the Army went and uh, got a general to do a major investigation. His name was Piers. And this was a film that they were going to use to, like, see where everything happened. They might have made a mosaic for it or anything like that. But this was the, the reason that mission was flown was so that they would have pictures of that whole general area so they could say, well, this happened here, that happened there, and this, that type of deal. So that was as a result of the My Lai Massacre and the Pierce Commission, actually. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, okay, so we, we ended up, we, we ended Colorado, and then what? I get out of the Army, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how long were you in Colorado? Eight months. Okay. So a total of two years. And I was in Vietnam. a total of three years. Okay. I didn't, I was in the Army, you know, most a lot of people when they join or when they get out or when they get drafted get out like early you know they don't do the full time yeah me I did every damn day of my three years mm -hmm. you know they didn't let me out one day early and actually that helped me afterwards I didn't realize it at the time uh, because you know I ended up working for the federal government and that counts towards your retirement and all oh. this other garbage you know yeah um. So once, do you remember the, uh, 
day you got out? Sure do. It was June 23rd. It was a hot day in Colorado, probably 90 to 100 degrees. And um, I got out about noon, took my hat, threw it in the air, took my uniform and tore it off, got in the car, and drove to uh, San Francisco. Okay. Um, did you have family and friends there? In San I had a, I had a, in San Francisco? Yeah. Uh, there was a friend from Vietnam that I, I went off to see. Okay. You know, it took me like three days, two days to get there. Mm -hmm. It was funny because that was summer of 71 or something and uh, you'd be dry, especially in Nevada, you know, like Connecticut, there's one town on another. Nevada, there's nothing like that. It's mm -hmm. like you've got a town and then you got the desert and all this. And what was happening was, you know what hippies are? Yeah. Well, they were going to California, so what would happen is I guess the sheriffs wouldn't let them into the town because they were grungy and all this stuff, mm -hmm. you know. So here I am driving and there's a bunch of hippies, you know, hitchhiking and all this stuff. And I'll never, I'll never forget, nobody's stopping to pick them up, right? Mm -hmm. So there was one guy who was a, had kind of long hair but not real long, and he had a sign and it said, unarmed student, you know what I mean? Yeah. I didn't pick him up anyway, but I thought it was funny. Mm -hmm. um, so you went to San Francisco uh, just to meet with a friend, or did you move? Yeah, there? I stayed there. No, I stayed there for a month, and then uh, I had parked my car on a pier, and it happened that there was a, when I wanted to get it, there was a longshoreman strike. Mm -hmm. So... They wouldn't let me get my car. Yeah, I had to go to the union headquarters and plead my case. Mm -hmm. And then the the guy from the union said, "Okay, you can have you. Can, we'll give you a piece of paper saying you know you can go get your car." So I go to, I cross the picket line and they're swearing at me and yelling at me and all this other mm -hmm. business. I go inside and the guy there goes, "They gave you a pass. <laughs> Nobody ever gives us a pass for this." So I said, yeah, well, let me go get my car. Well, it wouldn't start mm -hmm. because it was sitting there for a month, I guess, the yeah. battery ran down. So finally we got it going, and then I drove home. You know, it took me five days to get home. To uh, Connecticut? Yeah. Okay. Um, how was your homecoming when you came back? Woke up my parents at midnight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, what are you doing here? Uh, well, uh, you know, I finally got home. Uh, did you keep in contact with your family? Your yeah, I did. I used to send the. Uh, we used to. Uh, I used to send them letters. My problem was, I told you about that rocket attack, right? Mm -hmm. I, I wrote my mother a letter that talked about it, and she freaked out, you know. So, yeah. after that, I never wrote anything ever happened near me, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. So, did you uh, go back to work or? You said you worked well, I didn't have a. I didn't have a. Actually, what happened was I. I had dropped out of school. It was funny about that too. Is uh, I dropped out of school, and when I was in Vietnam, I wrote a letter to Central saying, you know, I want to go back when I get out. Blah blah. Next thing I know, I get a letter saying I've been accepted. You know, this is when I'm in the middle of Vietnam. <laughs> I showed it to my officer, officer, and he says, I don't think you can go back right now. <laughs> yeah. You know. So then. So then when I uh, got out, I, uh, well, not what, probably towards the end of my uh, time frame or whatever the heck it was in the Army, I wrote him another letter and they said, yeah, you can come back and all this business. And I changed my major to a teaching major and I had to do a year. Mm -hmm. I had to do a year of uh, courses. Took a lot of education courses, which were absolutely worthless, but that's beside the point. And student taught and all that type was of that thing. Was that on the uh, GI Bill? Yeah. Okay. Um, so after you went back to school, uh, did you go to work? You said you worked in the federal government. After. Right. So I couldn't get a job once I uh, graduated. Mm -hmm. And it took me about a year to a year and a half to find a job. I ended up getting a job with the Veterans Administration. Uh, first I worked at schools. I worked at Central, helping people get their VA benefits. Then I ended up uh, inspecting schools, uh, going through school records to see 
see if, uh, let's say, veterans were actually passing their courses. And then later on, I started dealing with incompetent veterans, which um, veterans who get benefits. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them can't handle their money because of drug, alcohol, psychological problems, traumatic brain injury, um, old age, um, dementia, you name it, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, I used to appoint people to handle their money and have to do reviews on them. And also, at the same time, I was also in the reserves. I was in the reserves for like 21 years. Okay. Um, so you'd have to go in for training with that every now and then? I'd go uh, one weekend a month plus two weekends a year. Okay. And that, I did photo interpretation for about half the time. And then I became an intelligence analyst. Okay, so that was um, just to, more on the side. Huh? Were you doing that kind of on the right. side? Right, okay. right. I never was activated. I almost was activated for Bosnia, mm -hmm. you know, but thank God I got out of it. Um, so you said 21 years, so that was in the 90s when you stopped. Uh, yeah, I, I was from 1974 to about 1997. Okay. Um, Actually, maybe 96. I don't know. You know, Whatever ad added up to 21 yeah. full years. Plus three years active, so that's 24 years. Mm -hmm. um, and did you, uh, your other job the veteran, with the Veterans Administration, was that um, your entire career doing that? Yeah, I did. I was with the VA for uh, 36 years. Okay. Um, so during your service... Um, did you feel a lot of pressure and stress during that? I know you said you didn't really, initially you didn't really... You well, you know, like from what I saw or... Just in general. Okay, there were two, well, we're, doing, we're dealing with two things. One, I hate to say it, but I was pissed off that I was in the service, you know, because it's kind of like you're, you're losing three years of your life to a degree, plus you're, uh, you're under... You have this, you know, people telling you what to do and giving you a hard time over, like, haircuts and appearance and whatever they decide, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So you've got that, all right? So I remember coming home and being, like, angry for about a year or so. Mm -hmm. The other part of the problem was when I came back, you couldn't say what you were doing. Like, I'm trying to think. If you were in a service wasn't in your interest to broadcast it. So right. it was like that three-year time frame was kind of like you couldn't talk about it to anybody. Yeah. You know? I mean, I went back to school. I mean, uh, Central actually was a fairly uh, non... They wouldn't really give you a hard time there, but mo you still, still kind of kept your mouth shut, you know? Yeah. Uh, there were schools where you, that wasn't the case. Okay, uh, I never had anybody really give me a hard time, but I never really uh, broadcast that I was a veteran. You know, there was a time frame. I don't. You you weren't around for this. You know Reagan. Yeah. Right. Let's say when he. I remember marching in a um, uh, Veterans Day parade in Hartford. Uh, during the Reagan years, beginning when he became president and afterwards. And in the first parade I marched in, we were booed. Okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. A year later, people were cheering. There was some sort of a turning point in there, you mm -hmm. know? So, let's say the 70s, you had to keep quiet about being in the service, not wear your uniform, things like that. By the 80s, that had changed. Okay. So do you think it became a lot easier to deal with um, your time in the service once people are more accepting of it? Right. I mean, the thing was, too, though, I mean, um, I remember going to Disney World, and it took 41 years before somebody ever said, thank you for your service. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So. Um, but, um, so when you were there, it was just kind of the stress of not wanting to be there. Indiana. Yeah, kind of that. Yeah, I mean, I, I did not have any PTSD because of, you know, seeing dead bodies or anything like that. Okay. Um, was there anything you did for good luck, anything special? 
No. Okay. Um, so what did uh, people do for entertainment over there? Drink. Go find girls. Uh, they did have USO shows. Mm -hmm. They had Bob Hope come through every year. Did you go to any USO shows? I never went to Bob Hope's show, no. Uh, I was working that day, as I remember. Uh, we did have a club, and we did have entertainers come to the club, like Filipinos, Australians. That was one thing when I was going from Saigon to Da Nang at the, the first time. <coughs> We had like a um, group of Australians. They were entertaining at the club, and I saw them that night. You know, mm -hmm. Usually, we get Filipinos. They'd have a tendency to uh, mispronounce the words to the songs and everything. You know? Okay. Um, do you remember any particularly humorous or unusual event stories? When we were over there, and I was over there. Uh, I used to get my home newspaper. Mm -hmm. Well, there was another guy that used to get his home newspaper and uh, get the Saturday edition. Well, he opens up the newspaper and he goes, My girlfriend's getting married, <laughs> but not to me. Yeah. <laughs> and after that, he was a hurting puppy. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was funny to everybody else, but not to him, okay? Yeah, right. Um, any other stories like that? No, I could tell you some bad stories about like starving people and all that type of thing, but I don't know if you'd want to hear that. Well, if you want to share it, then. Uh, when I, Da Nang is a port, right? It has a um, river that goes into it and a bay, and uh, there was a German hospital ship there called the Helgoland. We drive right by it. And what was happening during the war was um, we had a lot of refugees. The United States used to bomb and shoot artillery into the countryside. And that forced a lot of people into the city. I mean, raised the population of the city dramatically. Same thing in Saigon, for that matter. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, one day I went to uh, the Da Nang Hotel for uh, lunch, come out. I'm sitting in the back of the truck with another guy, and this woman comes up. And uh, she had like a tattered outfit on and tattered hat, and she had this baby that was like, looked like he was half dead, mm -hmm. okay? Scabs, things. And she was begging for money. They don't generally do that. And so I gave her a $20 bill, you know. What would be a $20 bill in American money, but it was, we used to have what they called MPC, which was a B-52 bomber or something. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and I turned to my friend and I said, aren't you going to give her anything? He said, no. And I said, why not? Because she's probably going to die anyway, mm -hmm. which is probably true. Yeah. And I, I thought about that after, like, what could I have done? Well, I could, we could have taken her to the German hospital ship, which would have treated her and the kid. Plus, because of the war and because of what we were doing in the war, if these, country, these people lived in the countryside, they'd, be, they'd, they'd make their own food, grow their own food, and, you know, it would be okay. But we were driving these people into the, you know, getting them out of the countryside into the cities, giving the Vietnamese government tons of money to take care of them and they weren't doing it, you mm -hmm. know. That's basically one thing I saw that really ticked me off, you know. Yeah. Do you think um, that influenced your view of the military leadership or the government, the American government? Of the, of the military le leadership? Well, Our military of, leadership? Their military? Or the war in general or what? Well, just kind of your ideas on the military and war in general. My, I'll tell you something. My ideas on war are this. A couple things. Number one, I think there should be a universal draft. I think that um, what's happened now with the volunteer force is that they can send them anywhere as many times as possible and they will wear them out. Because you can't continue to go to bad places and see bad things and uh, 
be normal. Mm -hmm. Okay. Vietnam, you went for a year, and you would then you would be you know it'd be over. Nowadays, uh, nowadays you could send people like if they joined for three years, they could spend maybe two years there or six months there, alternating. And you, you'd have people going six, seven times, depending on how, you know, what their job was and things like that. So you kind of wear them out and wear them down. You end up with a lot of PTSD. I think 35% uh, of the people that, you know, in Afghanistan and Iraq end up uh, filing for PTSD because of what they've seen. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, I also think that it would help having people in Congress that were in the military so that they wouldn't jump into these things as quickly as they do. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that they, you know, more, th more thought should be uh, given before you get into a war. And then when you get into a war, you should uh, fight to win it. Because you have a responsibility to the people that die or get wounded, or will never be the, be the same again. I mean, <clears throat> you end up play, if you have a war, you end up paying VA benefits, and people file for compensation or pension. They could they could be paying for benefits for them, their wives, and their children for up to like 92 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, last World War One veteran died somewhere in the 2000s, 2005, 2006 or so. Mm -hmm. When I was in the sur when I started at the VA, we had uh, Spanish-American War veterans. Now the World War II veterans are dying out. Well, widows and those veterans, some of those people are still getting money. Mm -hmm. Okay? And, you know, like I say, average age of a Vietnam veteran is probably about my age, which is around 70, you know? So, you know, as you go on, there, there are results to this thing, you know what I mean? Yeah. I remember when I was working for the VA at uh, Central, we had, I had one girl, come, woman come in. She was taking a, getting a master's degree in education. Her father had died in World War II, and she got married, and her husband died in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. This was like in 1973 or four or something. So... I mean, you know, I mean, she was affected at least twice. Yeah. Um, so during your service, um, what did you think of your officers and your fellow servicemen? There were some good officers, some bad officers. Um, same thing with my fellow servicemen, the, the regular servicemen, the... Um, you know, people on of my rank and all that stuff, they were fairly decent, but fairly intelligent because it was military intelligence. Mm -hmm. Not everybody was super smart or anything, but there were a lot of them that were. A lot of them didn't, hadn't gone to college yet. Some of them would never go to college, but they were basically highly intelligent people. Uh, some of the officers were morons. Some of them were pretty smart. Mm -hmm. uh, the NCOs, same thing. Some. The problem with now, well, some of the NCOs were good and some of them were strange. That's all I can say. Okay. <coughs> Did you keep a journal when you were over there? No. Okay. Um, uh, were you awarded any medals or citations? I got uh, Army Commendation Medal. That's all I, I received. Okay. Um, friend of mine gave me a friend of mine gave me uh, his uh, silver star for fifty dollars. I got that upstairs if you want to see it. Um, did you sustain any injuries? Uh, as far as uh, let's say a shot or uh, whatever you know shrapnel, no. But. I ended up getting uh, prostate cancer because of Agent Orange. <clears throat> uh, I, in fact, I talked to the, the guy that was my roommate in Vietnam the uh, Christmas time, and he, we were talking, and I said, well, have you had any problems since you got a, yeah, I got diabetes. He said, how about you? Oh, yeah, I got prostate cancer, okay? 
Well, the planes they used to drop the Agent Orange were also the planes they used to spray the cities for insects, you yeah, know, yeah. mosquitoes. So did they cause, did it cause my prostate cancer? I don't know. Did it cause his diabetes? Maybe yes, maybe no. I don't know. It's possible, mm -hmm. you know? Did you join any veterans organizations? Oh, okay. Yes, I joined the, the VFW and I also joined the DAV. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> I never joined a veterans organization until I retired. Okay. Uh, I belong to one in Berlin. Uh, you know, most of, most of the guys are Vietnam veterans. There's a couple World War II vets and uh, a couple post-Vietnam, you know, um, I don't know, Persian Gulf, things like that. But most of the people are around my age. Okay. Um, did you join um, right after you left the service, or did you? No, I, I joined like um, maybe seven or ten years ago, something like that. Once I, once I retired, you know, mm -hmm. to give me something to do, keep me off the street, that type of deal. Okay. Um, do you attend reunions? Never went to one, but um, there, my unit has had them. Okay. Seem to have them every two years. Um, so overall, how did your uh, service and experiences affect your life? It made me. Uh, basically, um, I wouldn't have got a job with uh, the VA. Uh, I wouldn't have understand what it was like to be in the service. See, I used to read a lot. I mean, I read a lot of history. I read a lot of books. I still do, for that matter about war and history and things like that and I understand it a lot better having been in it plus like I say <coughs> I get a I get a pension because of the military plus I get a uh, compensation because of my disability plus I had got a government job because mm -hmm. I was a veteran so you know basically shaped my life in that way okay um, is there anything else you want to add that we haven't discussed no, that's about it. Okay. Um, well, I'd like to thank you for your service and also for taking the time to be interviewed. Sure.